Good morning. Whether you're online or in person, we're happy that you're with us. If you're online, please hit the little chat button and let us know you're alive and well and that you're out there. Have a few announcements. Um, the offering, you either do that online or we have the little boxes at, um, at the doorway. You can put that in. And uh, if you're in here, we'd like for you to fill out one of those little yellow cards and put that in the box so we have a record of your attendance. We do have women's Bible study tonight at the Parsonage at 5 o'clock. Mixed Bible study is tomorrow morning at 10. Ad Council meeting, 7 on Monday, and that is, I'm sorry, Tuesday, and that's via Zoom. And then we're having an in-live, an in-person live meeting of the Decide team, 7 o'clock on Thursday. We have an architect coming to talk to us. And for the July float, in the Ostrander Parade, we need about eight or ten bales of straw or hay to put on the wagon. So if anybody has a source for that, please let Holly know that. And on that same topic, Who anybody is welcome to come and participate as part of that because I need people to hand out. We've got bags that we're going to be handing out and probably maybe tossing some candy or something. We'll get it all figured out. But it should be a fun time. But I do need hands so people can walk or sit on the porch. What time? So lineup is at 9, 9 a.m., if I remember correctly. So um, Ostrander Civic Association, if you look that up online, if you have any questions, um, they should have a link to it. Okay, Susie, what do you need for Bible study or Bible school? Let us know you're coming. Good. Is there anything else we need to lift up this morning? Yes. One service at 1030 because of the 4th of July. It'll be down here. Are we having Sunday school? Yes. And sun, Sunday school at 930. Okay, let's stand for the call to worship, which will be on the board. What delight comes to the one who follows God's ways. They won't walk in step with the wicked, nor share in a sinner's way, nor be found sitting with a scorner's seat. Our pleasure and passion is remaining true to the word of I am, meditating it day and night in true revelation of life. We will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design. Deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of our life. We will never be dry, and we will never be faint-hearted. In his presence, we are ever blessed. 
for the service, we will include them in this time together. Um, yes. Oh, I do. Thank you. Yeah, I'm getting used to that. Thank you for the reminder. So we want to be praying for all the people that have been uh, affected by that terrible building collapse in Miami. Um, I, I understand they're still doing search and rescue, but it's not looking uh, very promising. So we want to pray for all the people affected by that. And I was reminded that there's a terrible heat wave in the Pacific Northwest. In Portland, Bob was saying it's going to get up to 110 today. That's pretty unusual. So, and as we think about it, that, that whole area out west is also f affected by a terrible drought. Um, we can pray for, for that, for relief from that. Um, please be praying for the Jack Milbauer family. Uh, his son, Jason, is a missionary that we've been supporting for over 20 years now in Kazakhstan. He's actually come to speak uh, to our congregation a couple of times. And it just so happened, Jason was on furlough and uh, was here for a big family reunion, and his father, Jack, passed away on Monday. So he was able to be here uh, for his father's funeral and, and to be here for his mom and his siblings. So, and actually, I'm heading up there today for a visitation. And uh, so uh, if you would pray, pray for him and pray for his family. Please remember, there's a young lady, this is a, an anonymous request, but she was admitted to uh, the ER yesterday morning with uh, um, alcohol. Uh, well, she needs to have be detoxed from alcohol addiction. So it's uh, very serious. It, it's affecting her um, uh, organs, and so uh, we've been asked to pray for her. The Lord know who's, knows who that is, and be praying for our youth mission trip. So can we have a hand of, of the, all the youth that are going to be going and adult volunteers? Hey, all right. Um, we've got like 10 or 11 youth that are going and five adult leaders. We're heading down to Jacksonville, Florida to do some hurricane relief work down there. Uh, pray for our safe travel. Pray for a, a very productive mission. Uh, we're so excited about this, since we, especially since we didn't get to do it last year. But uh, be praying for that. Um, I'll give you a moment now to, to pray for anything that might be on your heart and if we can be in agreement for these things. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this beautiful day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to gather, to worship you, to fellowship, God. Pray that we would really encounter you today, that we would be refreshed in our spirits and empowered to serve you, to be your representatives here. Father, we do um, come together in agreement of prayer, and thank you that you uh, encourage us to do that, to bring our joys and concerns before your throne and that you're ever ready to hear us. God, our hearts go out to those who have been involved with this terrible building collapse down in Miami. We think first of those who have lost their lives and we pray for their families, God, who have to now go on without them. We pray that you would comfort them as only you can. We pray, Lord, for those who are injured, um, and are in the hospital right now, recuperating. We pray, God, that you would sustain them, that you would touch them and bring healing to them, and not only physically, but also emotionally. We can't imagine the emotional trauma of being involved in something like that. And Lord, we pray for those who may yet be in the rubble and alive and need rescued. 
Lord, help them to hang on. We pray that you would be there right with them and comfort them, Heavenly Father, and encourage them. And Lord, we pray that you would lead those rescuers, those recovery workers in the right direction, Heavenly Father. And be with those um, families that, that are going to face the hard task of, of, of having to go on without their loved ones, Lord. We know that there are many that are still unaccounted for and, and may not be recovered alive. Lord, we pray that, that you would draw up alongside of them and help them in their great time of need. And we pray for the churches around that community and the dis, uh, Christian disaster uh, agencies that are gonna stream into that area to help. We pray that the light of the gospel and the hope and, and love of Christ would just be shared in such a way that, that people's hearts would be lifted up, God, and that they would gain courage and hope. Lord, we pray for those in the Pacific Northwest and the Southwest as well. Um, we know that there's a bad drought out there and an incredible amount of heat. And Lord, we pray for relief. Bring the coolness uh, of fresh Pacific breezes across that area and bring rain, Heavenly Father, uh, to a parched uh, southwest. And Lord, we pray that in this whole experience that people would turn to you, God, because you are a God who hears and answers. And we pray that, that this would be a time where people would turn to you and look for deliverance and relief. God, we pray for the family of Jack Milbauer, that you would comfort them. We thank you for his life and, and uh, the impact he's made on his family and those around him. We pray that today and tomorrow would be a great day of celebration, remembering him. And um, Lord, comfort those uh, family members and friends, and, and may they find strength uh, in you at this time. Lord, we lift up to you this young lady who has ended up in the ER with effects of alcohol addiction. Uh, we ask that you would first bring healing to her organs and sustain her. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would heal her completely, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually, that, that you would deliver her completely from this addiction. And Lord, give those uh, around her that, that love her and want to help her wisdom that they might be uh, able to build her up and help her along. Lord, we finally pray for our, our youth trip. Thank you for all those that are going, both youth and adults. We pray for your protection in our travels to and from. And as we are at the work sites, we pray for your protection as well. Help us, Heavenly Father, to do everything in your power Help us to sow your love and your caring. Uh, give us opportunity not only to show your love, but to talk about you as well. Uh, give us opportunity to be your witnesses. We are so excited, Heavenly Father. We pray for a great and fruitful trip. Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. And it's Jesus who's taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's the last Sunday of June. We are halfway through the year. Isn't that hard to believe? But it's also Alpha Sunday. So we are going to have an incredible video this morning. I think you all are really going to enjoy it. How can I resist evil? And I think it's especially appropriate, especially given what's going on in our nation and around the world. Um, and sometimes we feel helpless. We think, what can I do about it? Um, how can I help? Well, there's a lot that we can do, and uh, I think you're going to really enjoy our speakers this morning as we watch this video. And afterwards, we'll have a time of Q&A, so if you, if you want to make some mental notes or jot down some questions that you might have, we'll kind of uh, walk through those afterwards. So 
Lori, if we can go ahead and get that started. And uh, Mike, can you hit the lights around the side? Don't turn off the fan, but... <laughs> But hit all those bank of lights. Thank you. good power and if I can believe in that higher good power then I think I must give space for some amount of belief you know in evil as well no not really but I do believe in monsters why do I think bad things happen oh my gosh it's the luck of the draw it just happens we live in an imperfect world so it's just bad luck I think it's principle of nature because we have our good things of course we have bad things the guy I know, Bruce, came on Alpha. He was very intelligent and also very skeptical. And he was an atheist and nothing convinced him otherwise until the talk, How Can I Resist Evil? And at the end, he said, I'm a lawyer. And in my practice as a lawyer, I see so much evil. I've always believed in the power of evil. But now I realize that if there's a power of evil, it's only logical to believe in a power of good. Some people find it very easy to believe in evil and the devil. William Peter Blatty, who wrote the screenplay for The Exorcist, said this. As far as God goes, I'm a non-believer, but when it comes to the devil, well, that's something else. The devil keeps advertising. The devil does lots of commercials. Yeah, the Apostle Paul speaks about spiritual forces of evil that are at work in the world today. And the claim in the New Testament is that just as behind good is God himself, so behind evil is the devil. Now, that might sound a bit far-fetched, but for some, it's easier to believe in the devil than it is to believe in God. I was an atheist. I had great difficulty believing that God could exist. I became a Christian. I came to believe in God. But then somebody said to me that there's a devil. And I thought, come on. It's hard enough to believe there's a God, let alone to believe that there's a devil. Part of the problem is that I had a false image of God and of the devil. I had a picture of God as an old man with a beard sitting on a cloud. Simply, I had a false image of the devil. I thought of the devil with horns, a tail, cloven hooves, and a pitchfork. Of course, those images of God and of the devil are not only unbelievable, they're also unbiblical. The New Testament talks about a, a triple alliance, but the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world's the enemy around us. It's all the evil that's around us, the world that's turned away from God. The flesh is the enemy within us. The flesh is not the body, there's nothing evil about the body, it's the evil desires that come from within each of us. And the devil is the enemy above. Jesus clearly believed in the existence of the devil. He taught his disciples to pray, deliver us from the evil one. Jesus himself was tempted by the devil. So, scripture talks about the existence of the devil. Also, tradition, Christians down the ages have always believed in spiritual forces of evil. And you may have had this experience, particularly if you've had a powerful experience of the Holy Spirit. You suddenly find that there seem to be all kinds of things coming against you. Temptations that you weren't really aware of before. There's also common sense. How do we explain so much evil in the world? We live in a world where, where terrible things happen. Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire was part of the UN peacekeeping force in Rwanda, and he witnessed the genocide there in 1994. Because he had only a small number of officers, he was unable to stop it. Afterwards, he wrote a book, and he called it Shake Hands with the Devil. He wrote this, I know that there's a God, 
because in Rwanda, I shook hands with the devil. I've seen him, I've smelled him, I've touched him. I know the devil exists, and therefore I know that there's a God. There are two equal and opposite dangers when we think about evil. One danger is complete disbelief, and the other is an unhealthy and excessive interest in the powers and the practices of evil. Things like Ouija boards, tarot cards, horoscopes, palm reading, that kind of thing. People who are on a spiritual search often experiment with these kind of things. It's not the unforgivable sin, but if you do it, then turn from it, repent from it, get rid of any books or anything in your life associated with it, because we're not supposed to have an unhealthy interest with these things. Yeah, the devil wants to destroy our lives. Jesus described the devil as a thief who wants to rob us. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That is his ultimate aim. It's the complete opposite of what Jesus wants for your life. Jesus loves you. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's what God wants for you, fullness of life. The devil's aim is to destroy and he uses clever tactics. It's never obvious at the start where he's trying to take you. I was accused of murder when I was 15. At 16 years old, I eventually went to jail and I went to a detention centre called Medhamsley. It was very, very harsh. In that place, I was told what to do and I wouldn't do it. I was anti-authority. I had, I had a lot of physical beatings in there. I was put in solitary confinement a lot. And, and it didn't help me. I just thought these people were bullies. So when I got out of there, I was more angry than when I went in. I was in embarrassment of my mother. She said, you know what? She said, you're the son of Satan. You're evil. She said, you're worse than your father ever was. Now that was bad to me because my dad was very violent and my mum often raped her. So for me, for her to say I was worse than my dad, who was the son of Satan, it just got me really angry. And so my next step was to become a football hooligan. I started getting slashed. I got cut up across my face, I had my little finger chopped off. I was stabbed four times in the arm and chest. I've had a bottle in both eyes, I've got no front teeth. I had both my shoulders, my arms pulled out my sockets. It was anarchy. The love to fight, the things I did, which I couldn't mention, really. But I did some very, very, very seriously evil things. I was evil, I was sheer evil. The devil wants to lead us on a path to destruction. So what are the devil's tactics? Well, the first is doubt. All of the important things in life require faith, and therefore they're open to doubt. The devil wants us to doubt our beliefs and believe our doubts. But God wants us to doubt our doubts and believe our beliefs. The devil lies and causes us to doubt who we are and who God is. Jesus describes the devil as a liar and the father of lies. In the Garden of Eden, in the opening chapters of Genesis, which is really an expose of how evil works, the devil is described in terms of a serpent whose opening line to humanity is, did God really say? He casts doubt on what God has said. We see that really clearly with Jesus. At his baptism in the River Jordan, the words of the Father come from heaven. This is my son, whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. And immediately afterwards, Jesus is led out into the desert and the devil comes to him and his opening line is, if you are the son of God. In other words, the devil tries to make Jesus doubt his identity. The devil will try to get you to doubt God's goodness, to persuade you that God is a spoil sport who just wants to ruin all your fun. He lies about God's identity and about yours. And if he can get you to doubt your identity as a Christian, as a child of God, then he will. Yeah, many of us struggle with self-doubt, uh, lies about ourselves that other people have told us and we've ended up believing about ourselves. But our true identity is that we are children of God, deeply loved by our Heavenly Father and created in His image for a unique purpose. Another tactic of the devil is temptation. And all of us experience temptation to some degree. booze and sex and all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of things that tempt me. 
lying to people. I get very angry most of the times. I'm not gonna lie, a lot of girls. <laughs> Shops. <laughs> Being mean, rude. Procrastinating. Oh, my greatest temptation is cheating. If you think about it, all the good stuff is bad for you. And all the bad stuff is good for you. Well, women like, I guess. Going out and buying lunch every day instead of just making it myself. I try to change though. I try to like kind of focus on like what really matters, but the kind of quick fix is very tempting, but I try. So you can either withdraw from it and just ignore it, or you can go for it and it happens. There's nothing wrong with being tempted. Everybody's tempted. You can't go through life without experiencing temptation. Jesus was tempted in every way, just like us, except he was without sin. So it's important to make the distinction between temptation and sin. The New Testament makes it clear that it's the devil who tempts us, not God. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, Satan is described as the tempter. Occasionally we have a thought that comes into our minds and we think, where did that come from? That's not sin. It's only sin if we adopt it and act on it. But the devil makes us think that we've already messed up and now it doesn't matter what you do because you've already fallen. Then there's a tactic of deception. All sin is a form of deception. Again, in Genesis, where the devil, in the form of a serpent, says, you will not surely die if you disobey God. In other words, it's not going to do you any harm. But the devil tries to deceive us into thinking that God doesn't love us or want us to have the best in life. Jesus wants you to have life in all its fullness. He loves you. He doesn't want you to experience evil. He wants you to experience good. Yeah, and one of the other titles of the devil is the accuser. He makes us doubt God's goodness and love. He tempts us to break God's commands, which are there for our own protection. And then he accuses and condemns us. There's a big difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. It's when we know exactly what we've done is wrong and we turn away from it and receive forgiveness. But condemnation is from the devil. Condemnation is when we just feel really bad about ourselves. But the New Testament tells us there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. On the cross, Jesus took the condemnation that we deserve upon himself so that we don't have to. Our position in the battle has changed. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son he loves. In other words, you were in the dominion of darkness, where you could say, in a sense, the devil was in control. But through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, the moment you invite Jesus to come and be part of your life, he transfers you from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus, where Jesus is in control and there is total freedom. By 1995, I was a tramp and I didn't realize this then. The inside of my body was shutting down because all I did was drink, take drugs, didn't eat. I didn't realize I was getting septicemia. I had malnutrition and dehydration. In March of 1996, some people turned up on the street and they said to me, do you know Jesus loves you? And I chased them. Jesus, my nana sang about Jesus when I was a kid. There was no such thing a week after they came back. And I seen these Christian men and women on the street for the next six months. One morning I woke up, it was just a normal day. And I got my drink and my drugs and I collapsed. I was rushed to the hospital. I was in a coma for six days. My mother was asked to come to the hospital. She went to the hospital. I was dead. I'd had my last rites on the sixth day. Consultant said to my mum, there's nothing we can do. So she said, can I have a few more hours to think about it? So my mum went out of the room and there was a lot of people there come to say goodbye to me. And then Tony, my mate, said to my mum, there's some Christian lads here. And my mum went, well, what good's that going to do? How can that help him? He's dead. And they said, well, let's pray for him. So they went and prayed for me and they put their hands on my head and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, give this man your life. And I woke up, sat up, pulled the mask out my mouth. I was alive, come back to life. But it wasn't just a miraculous waking up at the coma. I woke up totally different. I knew I'd never drink again. I'd take drugs, I'd smoke. 
I wanted to help people. I actually thought I'd gone insane, to be honest. And these Christian men said to me, do you know what, Grant? You need to go on an alpha course. So I said, what's one of them? We went on the day away. So on the third talk on the afternoon, and I stood up and I said, Jesus, this is the exact words, I've never forgot it. It was November the 9th, 1996, at quarter to three. And I said, Jesus, and I, I've been told you love me, and I kind of believe that you love me, but it's not enough. I need to know something in my heart. And as I said that, and I said, sorry, will you come into my life? I fell back into my chair, and I was crying. I, I couldn't stop. At that moment, as them tears flooded out my eyes, I knew where I was from, I knew who I was, and I knew what I had to do. So that night, 10 o'clock, I went back to the streets of Middlesbrough, full of Jesus, and I began my ministry. That was 19 years ago. And ever since then, that's what I've done. I've gone, I've told people about Jesus, I've run 141 Alpha courses. There's a couple of things I say to people on the streets or in the prison when I first meet them because they're full of doubt, you know, I was doubtful and I say, well, Grandma, how do you really know that, you know, you didn't just wake up out of a coma? Now, maybe I did just come out of that coma by coincidence, but I often say, for the last 19 years, why have I lived how I have, you know, where did the violence go? Where did the anger and the rejection and not knowing about love, where did that go in one night? Jesus is supreme love. That's what changed That's what changed Graham Seed. So if it changed Graham Seed, it does for anyone. So if we experience this transformation, then why do we still struggle with temptation? And why do we still struggle with evil? The decisive moment of the Second World War was D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944. At dawn, thousands of Allied troops began to pour onto these beaches under heavy enemy fire. Though many lives were lost, it was the great breakthrough. Essentially, it was the day the war was won. At the death and resurrection of Jesus, the ultimate victory was won. That was the decisive moment. And the moment you invited Jesus into your life, if you did that, the power of sin was broken. But the war didn't end there. There was a whole period of months of the mopping up operations until VE Day, victory in Europe on the 8th of May, 1945. In a sense, right now, we live between D-Day and VE Day. The victory has been won, but we're still in this period of the mopping up operations, which will only be complete once Jesus returns and when we get to meet him. And if your experience is anything like mine, when I first encountered Jesus, then a lot changed in my life. But there are other times that I struggle with things, and if I'm honest, I still struggle with them today. One time, a few months ago, I was uh, biking along Oxford Street, and um, uh, I was a little bit away from the pavement, because uh, I like to bike a little bit away from the pavement for various reasons. And there was a black cab. Do you know the taxi drivers in London, the black cabs? There was a black cab behind me who was getting really impatient, and he started hooting on his horn. And then he came right past me, because he thought I was holding him up. He came right past me, really close. And he shot past me, and as he went past, he shouted at me, you're in the way, move over. And something in my spirit, <laughs> I don't think it was the Holy Spirit, <laughs> said, get in. <laughs> so, the great thing about a bike is that the, the cars do have to stop at traffic lights. So he got caught at the traffic light and I managed to catch him up. And uh, as I got to alongside, he said, you sh you're, you're in the way, you should move over. I said, what's your number? Because I know they don't like being reported. I said, what's your number? At that moment, the light changed to green. He said, my number, and he drove off. And I thought, right, I am gonna get him. <laughs> so I started biking after him. And 
I was looking at, I was trying to learn his number, 58815. I'm going to report him, 58815. And I could see, he was looking in his rear view mirror, trying to see what I, who, what I was doing. And uh, I managed to catch up and I got alongside him and he said, Nikki, you should keep to the rules. I thought, did I hear that correctly? <laughs> he said, Nikki, you should keep to the rules. The next thing I knew, he was leaning out of his window, shaking his alpha manual like this. <laughs> so I went up to him and I said, have you done the alpha course? <laughs> He said, yes, I became a Christian on Alpha two months ago. <laughs> so he hadn't had much time for sanctification. <laughs> I said, oh, what's your name? <laughs> he said, my name's Dean. I said, so nice to meet you. <laughs> I said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> By this time, he was a mixture of anger and so quite interested to meet the person who he'd been watching on DVD for the last 10 weeks. <laughs> the passenger in the back of the cab was totally mystified. <laughs> so eventually he turned around and he said, this guy runs the Alpha course. It's inspirational. It's changed my life. <laughs> and as I bite off, I thought, I really have got a long way to go. <laughs> We're still in a battle. It's a process, and it won't be complete until Jesus returns. So what's our defense? How do we fight this battle? Well, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 that to fight this battle, we have to be strong in the Lord. We have to put on the full armor of God. So effectively, the Bible is saying that we have to get rid of the bad habits and replace them with good ones. Stay close to Jesus. Keep your focus on Jesus with the belt of truth around your waist. Jesus said, I am the truth. This is the opposite of hypocrisy. It's authenticity, integrity, openness in your life. The breastplate of righteousness. Keep your relationships right. Keep short accounts. If you mess up, as we all do, ask God to forgive you and pick yourself up quickly. And the same with other people. If you fall out with someone else, deal with it quickly. Ask for forgiveness. Get it sorted out. Get involved in service, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Don't just sit around doing nothing. Get involved. Serve at church or in your community. Trust God in difficult times. Paul says, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. The devil's going to throw stuff at you, doubt, fears, anxieties, lust, all kinds of things. Keep on trusting, don't give up your faith. Put on the helmet of salvation. Win the battle of the mind. Salvation means freedom, the freedom which Jesus brings. All these temptations tend to start in the mind. A thought becomes an action, an action becomes a habit, a habit becomes a destiny. Know your Bible. Soak yourself in the Word of God. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I really encourage you to get to know this book, to read it daily if you can. Use a hard copy. Download the Bible in one year app, whatever works for you. Each time Jesus was tempted, he replied with a verse from the Bible. He knew the scriptures well, and he used it as a defense against the attacks of the enemy. Keep praying. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Keep close to God through prayer. And lastly, stand firm together. There is no armor for the back. We're most vulnerable when we're running away, but far stronger when we stand together. The good news is you can do it. James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We can overcome evil with good. That's how we attack. 
And one of the ways that we can do that is through forgiveness. In the prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples, known as the Lord's Prayer, he tells them to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Uh, Forgiving someone is one of the hardest things that we can do, but there is such power in forgiveness. My name is Bertie Emanuel, and I participated in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. I murdered many Tutsi under the order of bad leadership and have spent six years in prison and four years in community service. While in prison, fellow prisoners invited me to try Alpha. I went, but struggled to engage. I realized I needed to tell the truth about what I had done and wrote a letter asking for forgiveness of the relatives of those I had murdered. Life was so hard after being released from prison. I found my wife with two children that were not mine and I faced many heartbreaking situations. I didn't know how I was going to live with the genocide survivors after what I had done. My heart was filled with agony loneliness and fear. Encouraged by Alpha in prison, I decided to do Alpha again. I learned that Jesus forgives and experienced love in a way I had never known before. With the help of a local pastor, I went to find Vincent, whose mother and grandmother I had killed to ask for forgiveness. I now live in a village built for genocide survivors and perpetrators. Vincent lives in the same village. We have formed a friendship and I now experience peace like I haven't experienced it before. Day to day life continues to be a challenge, but I have found forgiveness and healing for the things that I've done. Paul writes, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't just go through life saying, I didn't do anyone any harm. That's not a great ambition. How about doing some good? There is so much injustice in our world and so much that can happen when we fight evil with good, when we fight against injustice. Look at what other people have done in the past, inspired by the example of Jesus. Look how Shaftesbury, changed the whole social condition of his nation in the 19th century. Look at Wilberforce, how he led the campaign to abolish slavery. Look at Martin Luther King Jr. and how he fought to bring an end to the segregation between black and white in North America. Look at Mother Teresa, who transformed so many lives by giving herself wholeheartedly to the service of the poor. This is not just for the great heroes of history. This is for you. Your life can make a real difference. Your life has a purpose. You can leave a legacy of transformed lives. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In Jesus' name. Uh, got a lot out of this morning's message. Um, I've seen it now three times and I could watch it a fourth time. It's just awesome. Um, Any initial uh, responses to the film this morning? Anything stand out to you? Maybe there was an insight you gained or or something uh, new that you learned that that you think, gosh, that's, that's really important for me to hold on to. Anybody? Yeah, Cindy. Oh, the difference between conviction and condemnation. Yeah, absolutely. Huge difference. Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, but he doesn't condemn us because in Christ there is no condemnation for those who have received his grace, his forgiveness. Absolutely. Yep. Anybody else? Um, So... 
Nikki mentioned several tactics that the devil uses in an individual's life, deception, doubt, temptation, distraction, shame and blame, false guilt. In your experience, what has been the uh, tactic that has been most challenging to you? Yes. Doubt. Okay. had, but immersing herself in the word of God um, gives her that foundation of truth that helps her to overcome that doubt. Um, one of the things I think um, I struggle with, and I think a lot of us do, is, is temptation. And, and you know, it, it seems like today there's just so much in our face. Um, you know, we've got the, the internet, we have um, the media, and it's just continually there that we have to guard uh, ourselves against that. Um, so talking about temptation, what's the difference between temp or temptation to sin and sin itself? And I'm glad they brought this up. They're not identical, are they? Um, we can be tempted, but we don't necessarily have to follow through with that temptation and sin. There is a difference. And uh, Jesus, of course, was tempted uh, multiple times in the wilderness and even um, before he was crucified, he was tempted to abort the mission and uh, by, by an un unsuspecting person, too. Peter kind of planted that seed in him. Um, but uh, just because we're tempted does not mean that we sin. And that's important to remember. You know... Um, I like the fact that they talk about our relationship to the devil changes when we become Christians. And uh, I think there's two, two prongs to this. And, and one is before we were slaves to sin and, and uh, open to the influence of Satan. We're no longer that way. Um, and the fact is now we're, we're free of guilt and uh, free of, can be free of addiction and fear. And we had the very powerful example of uh, Graham who overcame uh, uh, a life of what he called fear evil. And that, that is remarkable to think about. But I would also say that when you come to faith in Christ, um, you, you put a target on your back, spiritually speaking, because now you're really dangerous to the enemy. And so I think he doubles his efforts to try to trip us up and distract us and, um, and, and mess us up. And we see that in uh, a lot of Christians' lives, especially those who are very famous and very well-known and influential. And uh, it, it seems like that happens quite often. And so Paul always talks about being on guard against that. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have to be on guard because uh, Satan's going to be working overtime once you come to faith in Jesus Christ to try to trip you up because he doesn't need somebody else working in the world to bring good and to combat evil. And if he can, he can trip you up and put you out of commission and wound you, he's going to, going to try to do that. So we have to, we have to really uh, be careful about uh, protecting ourselves, and I really appreciate the way that uh, they describe putting on the armor of God, right? Um, there's things that we can do to protect ourselves. So as Tracy brought out the word of God, um, we talk about the, the, um, the, the sword of the spirit is, is equivalent to the word of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of, belt of truth um, being uh, prepared for our feet, for the sharing of the gospel, uh, talking to other people, but also being engaged in, in good works for the kingdom. Those are all things that we have to do. And the scriptures tell us that it's a daily thing. Um, we have to do it daily, consciously, so we're ready for battle. And Lori, yeah.
think that's very, very helpful to remember because you know, we look around our world and we see evil. Um, I think I look at, at what's going on in our own country and uh, the murder rate has gone up 150%, I think, in major cities. Unbelievable. do, what can we do about that, and, and uh, we, so we've got the power of the spirit in us, and, and the spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is able to accomplish in us great things to change our world, but I think it's also very important, and Mickey brings this out, and this will be the last thing, there's not only a battle out there, there's a battle in here, isn't there, there is a battle of what Mickey called the flesh, you've got the world got the flesh. There's a battle inside. And uh, even Mickey said, you know, I've got a long way to go. And, and so uh, sometimes I look at myself and I see, man, I, a, am I really a believer? And I know I am because it, we're, we base things on fact, right? Truth, not feeling. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks in the renovated part. But there's a battle inside that's got to be uh, won as well. A battle that has to be fought until we see Jesus Christ face to face. And boy, won't that day be incredible. But um, we've got the victory. Paul talks about, St. Paul talks about that um, we can be victorious in Christ in here and out there. It's a matter of staying connected to him, growing in our relationship with him, and depending upon so let's, let's pray, and then we'll have the praise band send us out. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we've had today. And Lord, um, thank you for the message that we've received. Uh, Lord, we, we understand, we recognize that there is a real power of evil operative in the world, and even that it's trying to influence us internally, God. And we thank you for the promise that in Christ we can be more, vic more than victorious. Um, both out there and inside of ourselves as well. Um, Jesus, we pray that you would just um, be such a big part of our lives and that our relationship with you would just be growing each and every day that we might experience your victory in every way. And Lord, we pray, make us agents of your peace and your love um, that we might be used by you to defeat evil and bring your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's